Welcome to GeoInteresting, presented by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. From the ocean's depths to deep space and everything in between. Welcome to GeoInteresting, where we present conversations with innovators, explorers, and pathfinders. Today we're joined by Mark Anderson, founder and publisher of the Strategic News Service Newsletter. Mark is also the founder, chair, and host of Future in Review, an annual gathering for tech leaders, investors, and policymakers The Economist called the best technology conference in the world. Mark was selected by Fortune as one of the hardest, smartest people they know and has earned an international reputation for his contributions in the areas as diverse as technology, education, computing, economics, genetics, physics, and medicine. Every year, Mark offers his 10 predictions for the upcoming year. For the past 10 years, he's enjoyed a 94% accuracy rate. To quote Fortune again, they recently said, no one does predictions like Mark Anderson. Mark, welcome. Recently, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency welcomed you to give a presentation entitled Prediction Accuracy Through Pattern Recognition and Next Generation Computing. Right off the bat, Mark, I have to ask about that accuracy rate, 94%. I have, uh, I'd say, two things that are on my side in terms of getting a high number. One is I get to pick what I'm going to write about. So it's not a job job, right, where I have to tell you every morning what how's Apple going to do or yep. – um, so I get to select the thing. That's that's helpful and is a strong bias toward having a high number. I can pick which subject I'm looking at and which things I think are about to happen. The other is if I don't – if it's literally gut feeling, right? So if you feel pretty good about something but not sure – so, so as you train yourself to look at patterns, you go through this gut thing where you're, you're learning, you know, oh, I made, I made a mistake, made a mistake, got it right, got it right. Yes. And you, you learn, we talked about in this talk about dropping frames, which, which is a way of seeing clearly and being better able to see patterns you wouldn't normally expect. So you learn about how are you doing on that. And you develop an intuitive sense. Well, if I don't, if my gut doesn't say, you know, Steve's going back to Apple, I'm not going to say it. So I have that advantage too. It's really, it's really got to be something where I am deeply certain that this pattern was just broken and this is what's going to happen. If I'm just half certain, I don't have to say a thing. You talk about pattern makers and pattern breakers. Can you elaborate? Most people are familiar with the pattern maker pr part of this thing, right? And so they expect tomorrow to be like yesterday. We were talking about rear view mirror guys. Because all the guys who are in market research to us are rear view mirror guys because they're always looking at how many things sold last year and adjusted up and down by 3%. That's the worst possible way to do this work. So um, when you see a pattern break, you know, when I'm looking through a source, so I'm looking, I'm reading, doing a lot of reading online, and I'll see a, a, a phrase like, um, this is the something something in, in, in ten years or fifty years or ever recorded. You know, the hottest year, whatever it's going to be. There, there are statements all the time, which leap out at you as pattern breakers. And, and I always want to know. Well, okay, if it's, if that's true, then then what? Well, global warming is what you know, or then what? Oh, China's about to fire some missiles is what? So there there are these different triggers that tell you something's up. There's a reason why a pattern broke whether it's human, you know, a person doing something or whether it's nature doing something. So that's, that's what I'm looking for. And, and when you think about it mathematically, <clears throat> pattern makers are a sign of stability. You know, so the, the, the volcano didn't go off for 500 years, right? There's, every day you get up and it didn't go off again. A pattern breaker is when there's a sudden increase in, in activity. You go, wait a minute, the pattern just broke. What happened? We're about to have a volcano go off. You've already mentioned framing, but you also said that you want us to see the world like a baby. Imagine um, the human brain the day of birth or the day of conception. Depends on how far back you want to go, but you know it's pretty interesting, right? If if you were that brain, you were. Um, if you can remember that far back, and imagine you don't know uh, what, what a mother and father are. Probably you don't know you're speaking Russian or English. You don't know uh, what day and night. You don't know anything, and no one's going to really teach you anything. You're really going to have to just look at patterns and figure out. Oh, that's a mother. That's that's a day. That's a night. That's a you know these things repeated again. I guess that's something that's going to happen. So the the biocomputer at that stage, I think, is at its most adept. Uh, 
Now, we know that they're the largest number of neurons about uh, age 14. Then we start cutting back on them. But, but in terms of thinking about how the activity that has to happen in the human brain at birth and beyond, you know, those early three years, I think, I've got a personal theory that, that in fact, the reason most of us can't think back, remember back probably three years old or two years old. There's some kind of a barrier there. Why is there a barrier? I think the barrier is partly because we're restructuring the brain so fast that it's literally impossible to be also running memory later on what we did. Once it's kind of set, then, okay, now let's start storing stuff. But I think a lot of the things that are happening early on are just massive restructuring or structuring of all the connections. So, yeah, that we want to get back to the, that place of seeing where we had the same... Um, objectivity about what we saw. What role does next generation computing play into this? I'm thinking of computers like Watson or IBM's True North chip. So um, there are these different tracks people are taking right now. You, you read about predictive analysis, very hot software area. Um, I think people are in some ways on the wrong track in, in some of these paths because not that they're not working, but maybe you get a 5% bump or you get a 10% bump. It's not a 200% bump. And uh, I like Watson a lot. I think Watson's going to be a big hit. But, but what we really need is to take the whole compute system and redo it, throw out the old one, put in a new one. And the new one's going to be pattern-based. And we're starting to get now the, the chips and the tools. So IBM did True North. Uh, we'll, we'll see a lot of chips which, which fit the definition of either what I call PRPs, or pattern recognition processors. I believe we'll see lots of those. Uh, and or what they call brain-inspired, which goes beyond PRPs. PRPs are going to be the front of those things. And then there'll be other things inside them that look like neurons or act like synapses and so on, right? And, and that kind of architecture is, is going to be radically different and radically better, 10,000% better at finding patterns. When that happens, the good news is the system will see a pattern. Mm -hmm. The bad news is it'll tell you, mm -hmm. I just saw a pattern. And you'll go, wow, that's amazing, a whole new discovery in physics or whatever it is, right? But it won't necessarily be able to tell you how it found it mm -hmm. or how it connects back to what you knew about physics to the fundamentals, right? It's, it'd be like string theory, where they, they published this thing out of nowhere. They didn't know where it came from. It was out of a book at CERN. And as they won't have the connectors back to the physical constants and the actual physical world. Mm -hmm. And to this day, for that reason, they are lousy at predicting things using that very well-accepted theory, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of tragic. And there's going to be... If you, if you hated that, you're going to really hate the rest of this stuff, because that's what's gonna, what it's going to be like. We're very, very smart about patterns, but not so smart about the causality of all this stuff. You talk about the scientific method, but for you there's a part that's missing, getting the idea. So for you how, do you, how do you find that catalyst? How do you get that idea? Well, this is what we're talking about. So imagine you're trying to solve, uh, you have a question, right? Um, I, I had a question, which one, one question was, are all the force laws uh, uh, related in some mathematical way which hasn't been described before? And we know we've got, so it's already been unified, we've got all this stuff done, the standard theory. But I didn't want to know that. I wanted to look at this not as a student would look at it from Stanford, but look at it clean, just totally clean. And it turned out there was a mathematical formula that I don't think people had found before. So um, that's interesting. You know, well, what was the question? Well, the question was what I said, and the, and the answer was get some colored pens, write all these for us. There are 13 different fields of physics that I was looking at and find the things that, that are shared. Right? There's something there that's shared in all these things. What is it? And then boil that down to a very short program on a Commodore 64. Let's talk about some of the predictions that you have for this year. We've already briefly discussed pattern recognition. I want to talk about your prediction that security will become a priority for CEOs. You believe that companies will reverse the downward spending trend on security as cost of poorly protected computer systems outweigh the cost of building secure ones. I should mention, uh, I run a thing called Invent IP, which is inventing nations versus nation-sponsored theft of IP. There are countries whose business model is based on stealing ideas, secrets. We all know who those countries are. Um, it's come, it's taken a long time for CEOs to get out of denial mode, and they're still not quite there. 
And during that whole period of time, they have not spent the proper amount of money to secure their companies. Neither, in, in their defense, neither have there been the right tools to do it. Uh, as recently, I think, as two years ago, if you said to me, I'll give you any amount of money to protect my company, it wouldn't matter. Basically, I couldn't do it. So um, we had the wrong tools. And we're, we're getting better now. The tools are more dynamic, they're more heuristic. They tend to be looking for any, any unusual patterns, patterns, right, uh, inside our network. Uh, or on a user, or that kind of. Th so now it, it makes more sense to spend your money than it did before. But until until now, until this year, the C the chief security officers, if you surveyed them, eighty percent said we're not doing enough. You survey the CEOs, only fifteen percent said that. So they weren't talking to their own guys, and they weren't spending money. So uh, the prediction, w you know, was based on a, a, a fair certainty that the problem was getting bigger. APTs are becoming more numerous. Um, there's a, a higher level of attacks. These CEOs are going to have to turn around and, and increase their spending. And, and they didn't for the last five years, but now they will. Even though Facebook recently purchased Oculus, the virtual reality headset maker for $2 billion, you believe that virtual reality will remain in the domain of entertainment this year. Furthermore, you believe that headsets that immerse people in a 3D world will not become a feature of everyday life. Yeah, I, I spent about five years uh, as a board member of, of a company called World Design out of the Hit Lab at University of Washington, and uh, we were the first guys to do major applications for VR. So I know VR a little bit, uh, and I love it. But uh, I do think it's about entertainment. You know, you're putting on these big, at least Oculus, right? I mean, we had that. We had that 20 years ago. So uh, it's, it's better now, but it's still the same thing. And I, I think that's great if you want to play video games. But what I found exciting is the augmented reality. I, I think something like Google Glass, uh, however you want to have policies around it to protect privacy and so on, but something around Google Glass where I can walk around New York and see a building and it tells me about the architect. Uh, I, you know, I can see you and it tells me who you are because I saw you at some party five years ago and I forgot who you were and I really want to know who you are. Uh, that kind of thing is going to break through so that, so that we have the cloud system basically at our fingertips and visually available to us since our eyes are our primary way of taking in data. You're the founder, uh, chair, and host of the Future in Review conference, uh, the next one coming up in October. Um, what gave you the idea? What's the reason behind uh, starting this conference? What was the catalyst? Uh, first, I'll tell you why I didn't start it. So everybody had a newsletter, had a conference, right? And I didn't do anything for uh, 10 years, I think. Because who needed another conference, even then? And then I thought, you know, if, if there was something that I could do that would be really additive and different, I'll do a conference. And I finally realized, well, the stuff that we're doing in the newsletter is really additive and different. And if I could bring that into a conference, okay, that's cool. Because we were making predictions that nobody was able to make. And we were finding these gigantic strategic things that people weren't seeing. Those are the two reasons people were paying for the newsletter. So, okay, let's bring that into a conference setting and see what that's like. And that's what FIRE is. So we say future in review. It's kind of a joke, but it's true. That's what we're trying to do. And you know, the economist calls it the best in the world as a tech conference, but it's really not a tech conference. It's really this place where you come to learn, almost as a fact, what's going to happen three to five years from now, and then what should we do about it? Mm -hmm. So we've kind of pushed the, the ball down the court a little bit. It's like not just what's going to happen, but what, what should we do about it? And that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So we have initiatives that come out of that conversation that are actually problem-solving you know, initiatives that everybody signs up for and run all year long. Finally, Mark, I have to ask, even though you have that 94% accuracy rating, why do you make these predictions every year? Why do you so publicly put yourself out there to make these predictions? That's the game, right? It's like saying, why do you play football? I mean, if you, if you don't like football, don't play. So for me, this is NFL. You know, this is the NFL. It's really fun. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it. I want to thank Mark Anderson for being on the show today. Mark is the founder and publisher of the Strategic News Service. Next week's news this week. To sign up for an annual subscription, visit www.stratnews.com. That's S-T-R-A-T-News.com. You can also learn about the SNS with a one-month trial available once per individual. That's four issues for $14.95. Mark is also the founder, chair, and host of the Future in Review Conference. The 13th annual Future in Review Conference will be held October 6th through 9th in Park City, Utah, 
For more information and to register, visit www.futureinreview.com. Thank you for listening to GeoInteresting.